Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. Brianne Grogan. If that name sounds familiar, yep, she's been on the podcast before. Dr. Brianne is a doctor of physical therapy, and she focuses on pelvic health. She has a wildly successful YouTube channel with over 450,000 subscribers and over 700 videos all about improving your pelvic floor and your pelvic health function. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about her recent darkness retreat. We're going to be talking about the deep connection of the pelvis to emotions, to trauma, to pain in the body, and really how you can develop a strong relationship with yourself so that you can feel emotions and get fast pain relief. Doesn't even have to be in the pelvis. So let's reintroduce you to Dr. Brianne Grogan. Hey, health junkies. I have Dr. Brianne Grogan on again today, and I'm so excited because it's been a while and I'm looking forward to reconnecting because she's had so many changes with her career, her life, everything in the last couple of years. So Dr. Brie, welcome back to the Health Fix podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be back. Thank you. Man, it's been too long. And so I'm like, man, we need we need a regular segment of fun here and talking about health in general, but really what brought me to bringing you back on is it seems that we're on this the similar trajectory of really trying to get that message out that we are so connected to our mindset. And I saw that you recently went through a darkness retreat and I was like, ooh, how was that? So give us the scoop. What like led you to be like, yes, I'm all in on a darkness retreat. And how did you find which one suited you? Give us the background on that. That's exciting stuff. Yeah. You know, this darkness retreat is really interesting. I heard about it a year and a half before I did it on several podcasts that I follow. So, you know, how, how we are, we love our podcasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're listening. And I kept hearing this this information about this sky caves, darkness retreat. And at the time I was actually living in Germany, uh, but my family and I were about to move to Oregon. And I was like, man, this keeps coming up, this darkness retreat and people are having these life changing experiences in this darkness. And so let me look this up. I looked up their website and they are in Oregon. I'm like, no, you know, (laughs) we're moving to Oregon. It's in Oregon. So I contacted them and said, hey, I'd love to come. And they said, okay, but we have a year and a half waiting list. (laughs) So I got on the waiting list and lo and behold, a year and a half later, which my dates happened to be right over the new year. So literally I spent the new year uh, changeover from 2023 to 24 in darkness. So it was four nights and essentially five days because, you know, you go in and then you have four nights and then the last day you you come out. So really four nights, five days in complete darkness over the new year. Um, And it was, it was so life-changing. It really was. It was like, just like everyone says, it was life-changing. Wow. You know, I think a lot of people think about first, like dipping their toes into some of these silent retreats, which for me, I'm so like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh my gosh, silence. And then then silence plus darkness, correct? Because you're all by yourself in there. Yeah. Now I had kind of prepared by doing actually two silent, well, sort of silent, two retreats that were about four days long. I believe they were four days, three nights of silence where there was no talking, no human interaction um, with with one another, although there was interaction because we were meditating together and we also were doing movement. So it was a really cool blend of um, ecstatic dance, yoga. It was a lot of uh, movement practices. So there was some noise. There was some, you know, songs for our ecstatic dance, but nobody was looking at each other. So there was no eye contact and there was no talking with the other participants. So it was like this mishmash of like ecstatic dance and movement with silence and meditation. It was really cool. And for me, that was like the perfect entry into silent retreating because I am a, bo- I have to move my body. I have to move and I need to like release because so much comes up when you are sitting with yourself and sitting with your thoughts. 
so much comes up that there has to be a way to release it. And the movement silent retreats that I did was a great way to help release some of that emotion. And when I was in the darkness retreat completely by myself, I brought, I was kind of silly. I brought all sorts of tools and toys and <laughs> I brought like bands, like exercise bands. And I had these plans to do some movement and yoga and like jumping jacks. And I did, I was moving a lot because it really helped me manage my fear, my yeah. anxieties, my emotions, things that were coming up. So movement um, is so healing. It is, it is, you know, and I, I, I think a lot of people have, definitely connected some of that, right? Like you're women who run and they're like, if I don't run, I'm going to lose my you know, mind, right? It's, it's where I sort things out. But I think we don't take it deeper than that, right? And and like you mentioned, you know, really being able to feel our emotions and feel them and let them go. And you posted, and this is, I thought it was just perfect timing for this podcast. You had posted on Instagram yesterday where you were kind of like showing just the, just rocking on your your heels, just kind of tapping. It was almost like a heel tapping. I don't know what the word would be. Bouncing maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't, I forget what you called it. We'll let you. Yeah. <laughs> you're, bouncing. You're yeah. just a time. It's a very loose. It's not jumping, but it's just gently bouncing your heels up and off off the ground and you're, you get this whole body vibration. It's amazing from your heels all the way up to your head. You can feel this kind of blah, 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 bouncing vibration. Ah, uh, you know, and, and I had said in, in my comment on there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I do this when I need to let something go. And I think a lot of us, we have habits that we, we sometimes employ automatically, but I don't think we're connecting that that's why we're doing it. Have you found in your practice or just like maybe an observation of people or yourself that there are other things you're gravitating towards when you need to like let something go? Yes. Um, for me, it's actually voice and vocalization. That is huge for me. You know, in the the ways that I was trained for embodiment practices, I'm actually a certified embodiment coach as one of the one of the many facets of what I do. <laughs> But I have also done a lot of work in uh, studying Tantra and lots of different modalities have come together. But movement, breath, and sound are the three tools that we really use in embodiment and are often taught in Tantra as well. And it's ways to just release energy. Really, that's what we're doing. And so breath work has become very, very popular and a great way to release emotion and energy um, movement, as we've been talking about. But for me, sound is one of the most important tools. So just like a, uh, it can sound just, it can sound terrible, <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> those are the best ones to just let stuff go is just vocalizing. And actually I was working with a, a patient recently and doing some treatment of her pelvic area and really working on the stuck um, trauma really that was in her pelvic bowl from a fall that she took. Mm -hmm. And I encouraged her to start releasing with sound during our treatment together. And she experienced such profound relief. She was just crying. Tears were pouring down her face, but they were joy, like tears of joy as she began releasing through sound. And it was really helping her release the pain, the tension, and, you know, from the, from the energy, the stuck energy and emotion. I find sound fascinating. Like even how you'll find sometimes, I mean, a baby, right? A baby will kind of hum to a different, you know, tune when they're kind of self-soothing versus, you know, wow, I need, you know, something kind of thing. And, and we lose that. It's crazy. Well, I love that you brought that up because I actually tie so much together with <laughs> growing up years and uh, getting things stuck inside. So, okay, let me take this back if you don't mind, if you'll humor me. Okay. So I think it's really interesting that as little kiddos, we are incontinent. We mm -hmm. don't have control of our bladder or our bowels, right? Mm -hmm. And as we get older, as we get into toddlerhood and we start potty training and all of that, we start learning how to control our, our bowels, our bladder. And part of that is our pelvic floor muscles. It's just part of the process. There's more to it than pelvic floor muscles. But, you know, our pelvic floor muscles are coming online, the whole physiological process or neurological process of um, urination and being able to control our bladder is coming online. But part of it is learning how to control our muscular tension to keep things in and let things out. That is part of it. 
And at that same time, that's often when we are no longer cute little babies who are <laughs> crying and needing their mom's attention. And that's the only way they can get help is through crying and making noises, right? And we start getting in trouble for having tantrums or we start getting in trouble. We start being told to be quiet or that doesn't hurt or that doesn't matter, you know, get over it type of messaging, <laughs> you know? And that begins when we are about at potty training age for many of us through no fault of our parents, just the, just the way it, it's kind of been. And I think it's really interesting that we're really learning to hold in so much all around the same time, around the same age. We're learning to hold everything in, our pee, our poop, <laughs> and our emotions. And we get really good at holding things in. And uh, it it's really takes permission to learn how to release again, because we've really spent our whole life learning how to toe the line and to keep up appearances and to not look like a crazy person. So <laughs> it takes retraining. It does. It does. And I think for us, there's also, like you said, you know, that holding, like if we look, especially with women, constipation is such an issue, right? Oh, and yeah. and holding in, holding in emotions, things of that nature. And a lot of times women will work with me and we'll go through all kinds of gut repair stuff and we'll go through the hormones, we'll go through the microbiome and we're left at like, okay, we're still doing this. And it's like, I always have to do something in pelvic floor because that's how I work. But I'm like, if we're not going through pelvic floor PT and getting results, I'm going, all right, we got emotions. We've got emotions here. Got emotions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have found it again and again and again, and also personal experience with myself. I think that I feel like I'm my own best evidence-based practice is on me <laughs> and on my clients. And of course, we love research and we love studies that support the work that we do. However, I think that lived experience is so, so profoundly powerful to acknowledge. And I definitely have had a lot of connections, made a lot of connections between periods of stress, tension, emotional upheaval, and physical impact on my body. And I've seen it time and time again with my clients. The emotional becomes physical. And then the physical is emotional. And so that impacts our emotions even more. And it becomes this cycle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, I, I'm happy that there are folks like us talking about this and, and it's needs more, obviously that's why we're here today. But I do know that even as a doc, you've probably seen this, even as a physical therapist, we're still trying to kind of encourage and teach. And so today, I hope we can kind of inspire folks to have a couple of little tools in their toolbox yeah. to be able to kind of take it forward. Because there was something that you mentioned about being able to feel the emotions, but also have this cultivate like cultivation of calm and peace within the body. And I think that's where mm -hmm. a lot of us are like, okay, I feel things, you yeah. know, a lot of patients come in and they'll be like, I know stuff stuck, right? but I don't know how to release and how to keep releasing. Like maybe I'll have a big release, but then it just gets stuck again. Or they'll do acupuncture with me and they'll be like, that was amazing. And then like a month later, like, um, now what do I do? <laughs> Totally. Totally. And it can be a lot. It can be a lot when you get that stuff moving and it can be overwhelming and scary. I remember I did a tapping session once with a friend of mine who was kind of practicing with me, the EFT tapping. And I think we went a little too far and it, it brought up so much that I was completely overwhelmed by the end. And so for that reason, I think a lot of people have maybe experienced something similar and it's like, I don't want to feel my stuff. I don't want to get things moving. It's safer when it's bottled up inside <laughs> and when I can just pretend it's not there. Um, or again, they're afraid they'll be caught in that, in the wave of emotion and never get out. And yeah. so it is so important to have um, tools to, to learn how to move it through and ride those waves of emotion so you don't get caught in the undertow. And I mean, it's a, it's a practice and it's very helpful to have guidance from somebody who understands and can help you, whether that's a, um, you know, a therapist or a somatic type of somatic movement expert or an embodiment coach or a naturopath or a physical therapist who understands this information is very helpful. And also cultivating that sense of inner peace 
is so, so helpful as well. So um, I could take this back to my darkness retreat if that is helpful. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to do this. And I think, I think one way that has really helped me and what I encourage for a lot of my clients is to really connect with your body as much as you can and do more work with your body, whether that's exercise. For many of us, it starts with just exercise as an embodiment practice, because that is getting out of your head and into your body through running or walking or, or movement, going to the gym. You know, that's beautiful, beautiful start. For me, my next step was bringing in and layering in more dance and hip circles, which you, you know me for. <laughs> you, you and I are sisters in this. We love our hip circles. I've been talking about hip circles on YouTube for, I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> but I mean, and of course, culturally, this is a huge thing in other cultures. This is normal for other cultures is to move their hips. But for my culture that I grew up in as a you know, a woman from Oregon, a white woman from Oregon <laughs> with Scandinavian background is not something we do. <laughs> and so, but getting in touch with my body through hip circles and dance and whatever, that was really the next step too. So embodiment practices that get you in touch with your body is very, very helpful. And it's not an overnight fix, but over time, it helps you cultivate that inner peace and that sense of self-trust and self-knowing and inner like self resourcing being able to resource yourself when you're feeling the ups and downs of life but then layered on top of that what really helped me in my darkness retreat was visualizing this little candle so this is very specific but for me i ended up visualizing this little tiny candle like a tea light candle in my pelvic bowl that was just like this little steady flame. And I just pictured it being in my pelvic area, this little candle. And every time I was feeling fear, because I'm a little scared of the dark, to be honest with you. So yeah, yeah. I'd hear weird sounds or I'd be like, I don't know, just also, when is this going to end? Boredom. Boredom was huge. Um, here's another one that's kind of, that came up for me in the dark. I was so constipated. We can talk about that here, right? I talk yeah, about this. Of yeah. Of I was, I was so constipated, everyone. I was just, I couldn't go to the bathroom because I was so off of my schedule and I wasn't moving the way I normally like to move. I didn't have my computer, my phone, like the things I do to kind of get things moving. I didn't have my coffee. I didn't have any of my things. And so I couldn't go to the bathroom and I was very anxious about this and all these thoughts coming through my head, all these emotions coming up, fear of the dark, when's this going to end, boredom, et cetera, and so forth. And so I just kept coming back to my movement practices, which I just mentioned, I would do some movement. And then I came back to that little candle, that little inner flame within that was just steadily burning in my imagination, of course, but it was a really beautiful anchor point to keep me grounded and centered in myself. And it's like, despite the challenges and despite the ups and downs and all of that, I just brought it back. And it takes, you know, it takes dedication and practice and consistency and, and self-trust. But I think because of all the years of embodiment work and dance and practice in meditation and practice in getting quiet and coming inward, I was able to really get a lot out of that when I was in the dark. And I think anyone could benefit from, you know, tuning in to something that anchors them to a steady guide within. It makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, the whole idea of being in the dark for me, I'm like, gosh, your schedules, like you said, would be off. But also, like, did you have any clue of like whether it was day or nighttime at all? <laughs> like, well, so I have to say, I cheated a tiny bit. <laughs> there was the the room that I was in. It was. The retreat center I went to had two basically caves, like they were built into the earth. And then the one that I was in was a tiny little cottage that had been retrofitted and converted into a completely dark, um, light sealed room. So everything that had been like a window, for example, was completely sealed off with like, there was nothing coming in through that, no light at all. But there was a door, you know, that you could get in and out of. And <clears throat> there was a, a protector that kept the light out from the bottom crack of the door. But I actually, 
I moved just a tiny little corner of this, just a tiny bit so that I just had a sense of like, is it the middle of the night or is it like, is there a little light coming through? It just, I needed that for my sense of control and to not go insane, to have just a tiny idea of possibly what time of day it was. So <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I, I probably, I mean, I, I was thinking about it when you had described it and I was like, man, I think I would be trying to hack something to be <laughs> like, I need to know, or like, do they screen you? Like, do they take your cell phone and your keys and everything? Like, do they like search you? No, they don't. And I mean, you could, like, I did have my phone in there and I didn't use it, but I could have, you know, and there, and also you can leave, like you have the freedom to leave the room. You're not locked in. So yeah. But I mean, for me, I really wanted the full experience. So I, I did it except for that tiny little mini cheat. (laughs) We won't, we won't hold you accountable for that one. Don't don't tell. (laughs) I mean, uh, just the fact that you did it, in and of itself, because like, even though they have like a, a year and a half long waiting list, I mean, really, how many of the population, how many people really do that, unless someone's been incarcerated and had right. you know, solitary confinement, Um, you know, those kind of things are just, it's, it's few and far between. So I would say I give you a lot of props, because I've attempted trying to do a silent retreat and haven't even got that far. So super, super props for, for even doing that. So well, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, again, I think it really is something that I wouldn't suggest anyone to just go into it blindly if they weren't prepared, you know, and I think that the ability that I did have to feel safe in my body. And again, that safety is so, so key. It's the foundation in order to really learn and take in any information and to really heal, to really get better you got to have that foundation of safety. And I think the more we can, again, turn within, come within, come into our bodies, come into our safety slowly, because especially for people with a history of trauma, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, it's going to take help and assistance and working with someone and working with yourself to really begin to feel safe in your own skin where you can feel and you can feel safe feeling. Uh, It takes time, but it's, so powerful, so powerful. It allows you to do crazy things if you want to, like go to a darkness retreat or do a silent retreat or, you know, jump off on a bungee cord or something like that, whatever it may be, that's your thing. You can do it, but I really think you got to go into these things prepared. Yeah. Safety is such a huge topic. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people are not, are still not connecting safety because we think of safety like you know i'm safe at my home i can lock my doors i'm not feeling threatened in my environment but it's like what if and and this is the hardest topic to really bring up with folks what if it's you that doesn't feel safe like what if you are the person that's perpetuating that that not safe situation how how do you work with clients you work with how do you you know even yourself if you want to talk about how you began to cultivate the safety feeling because a lot of people i think go you know, Brianna didn't really have trauma per se, like that someone would consider like a big T. But right. maybe there's some little T's. I don't know. How how do I know like safe versus not safe? How do I start working on this concept and, and exploring it in my body? Yeah. I mean, you're right. It's a huge concept. But basically, I mean, the nervous system is, a, it's a servant of protection. It's always scanning our environment for threats. And it will determine all sorts of things as threats. They don't necessarily have to be someone, you know, breaking into your home or a fire or some, you know, massive thing like that. Little tiny things can be threats. And it's very dependent on you, the person and your personal history and what is perceived by your nervous system as threatful for for you. So I think it's really fascinating. Pain science, I just love I geek out on it. And I love following the Noi group. Are you familiar with them? The Noi group? No, no. Okay. It's the, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's the, it's the neuro, um, oh my gosh, what are they? It's the Neuro Orthopedic Institute of Australia, I think it is. Okay. But amazing pain science researchers. And they've discovered that really understanding pain and the way pain and symptoms 
show up in our body, not necessarily because of actual physical injury in our tissues in some cases, but because of the way signals are interpreted in the, in the mind. And it's not saying that the pain or the symptoms are all in your head by any means, but it is saying that there's lots of things that contribute to how your brain interprets the signals that are coming into the brain. And if there's anything that's making you feel danger or unsafe, it's going to interpret the signals coming into your central nervous system as alarm bell, alarm bell, alarm bell. And it's going to be different. So it, one example that always I've, has stuck with me is like a uh, violinist who has a cut on their finger is going to potentially experience, well, actually, I think this has been studied by them. They experience more pain, more significant pain because of the cut on their finger, because it impacts their livelihood. It impacts every their day-to-day -day practicing, their finances, their whole profession is impacted if they cut or injure their finger because they can't play their instrument. Right. Whereas it wouldn't necessarily impact you or me in the same way. So it really is dependent on all sorts of factors and safety is at the bottom of it. So understanding pain, understanding how it all works is actually a pain reliever, a tonic in and of itself. But for any type of learning to occur, we have to have, we have to be able to essentially calm our nervous system because it's just upregulating. It's just, it's, it's making meaning out of everything in our environment. So it's making meaning out of signals coming in. It's even making um, meaning out of what, what you're hearing right now as you're listening to us talk. And so always coming back, I guess for me, I think as trite or cliche as it sounds, a daily meditation practice or some kind of practice of getting quiet and turning inward um, is is very important. And for safety specifically, one thing that can be really helpful is to be in the present moment, be in the here and now, because most likely, whether you had big T's or little T's in your past, whether you have pain and you're looking around at your environment and the signals coming in are upregulating things in your nervous system, what, whatever is going on, it's more than likely that when you sit down to meditate or when you sit down to have two to three minutes of quiet, even if you don't call it meditation, you're probably okay. You probably don't have a massive threat around you at that moment. And so just taking a minute to really be aware of that, to bring the presence into the moment, into your body by placing your hands on your thighs, for example, and anyone listening could do this right now, just put your hands on your thighs and just feel the weight of your hands on your thighs. And just feel that gentle pressure of the hands on the thighs. And you can even feel that space between where your hands end and where your thighs begin. That little space in between. It just brings you right now into like this now moment where you're not, you're, first of all, you're in your body. You're out of your head. So you're not thinking about the worries of the future or the regrets or memories or fears of the past. You're literally in your body right here, right now. And then from that place, you can even, you know, just look around your room, like let your eyes glance on something in your room. It doesn't matter what. And just kind of look at the thing, look at where that thing ends and then kind of toggle back to your body and be in your body and notice that space between where the thing ends and where your body begins. And just do that a couple of times, looking around your room and just reminding yourself, I am here right now. I am safe. I am present and I'm okay. In this now moment, I'm actually okay. And from there, doing your breath work or just a few deep breaths or prayer or journal writing or meditation or whatever it is that speaks to you. Or going on a walk, you know, getting up and going outside on a quiet walk where you can get out in nature and get some fresh air. But, you know, establishing that sense of presence and safety first is such a really powerful practice for people to do on their own. So huge. So huge. Because I found working with pain for all those years with acupuncture and, and, and whatnot, like, yeah, it, it, we get like looping in the head, like, my yeah. back hurts, my back hurts, my back hurts. And then it's, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm unstable, you know, and it, it just cascades. Right. Yes. Yeah. Feel that presence. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's the, it's a simple way to interrupt that vicious cycle that, because it is a vicious cycle of the, of the fear and the stress causing tension, causing pain, causing more tension and pain, causing more fear and stress, causing more tension and pain, causing more fear and stress. So y- you've got to find a way to interrupt that cycle and that presence and safety. Even if, even if you are having to simply accept that there is pain, <laughs> Even if you have to say, okay, I am here right now. I'm in my body. I am present and I hurt. My back hurts. But kind of just accepting that and also realizing that you are in a safe environment. Your environment is safe. You have food. You have water. You have shelter. Hopefully, hopefully anyone listening, you know, we need to get those physiological needs met, of course. Mm -hmm. But just that acceptance and kind of leaning into the fact of this is where I am right now without stories attached to it from the future or of the past. Because when we get in those thought loops of the back pain hasn't ended, nothing has worked. What does this mean for my family? My partner's going to leave me because of X, Y, and Z. You know, we get in these thought loops. And so simply just accepting where you are right now and being present is a really important first step. We don't need to feel amazing as we're sitting there. We just have to realize I am here right now. This is me right now. And I'm not going to think about the the future or the past. I'm just going to be present for a moment. It's a really powerful way to interrupt that pain cycle and the thought loops that can get us, that can keep us trapped. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think I never fully understood the pain loops that a lot of my patients were were dealing with until I ended up having some pretty bad sciatica because of a, a blown out L5 disc. Mm-hmm. And and I had to like kind of go back through all the techniques I was working with to to interrupt it. And and it's crazy though, like how you can in the moment just be like, I'm good. Everything's yeah. fine. And yeah. Mm, it comes down. And I know a lot of people listening might be like, yeah, your guys are full of crap, but like Guys, just got to try it. You don't know until you try. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's it's that neutralizing. We're, we're trying to ultimately neutralize. We're not trying to make life perfect or say things are perfect or fool ourselves in any way. It's really getting to neutral, to, to neutralize, not minimize. We're not trying to minimize or like, oh, you know, this is all in your head or it's all, you know, just get over it. Like, that's not what we're saying at all. It's just neutralizing, taking the charge away. Huge. It's huge. Yeah. Hey, Health Junkie, open to learning more from Dr. Bree. Well, she's got quite a few different programs. If you're just dipping your toes in and want to learn more about pelvic health, she has the Lift and the Overcome program. Lift is tailored to those with incontinence, prolapse, or are in need of pelvic floor strengthening. The Overcome program is specific for those with pelvic pain, painful sex, and tension. Now, If you're open to diving into the mind-body-pelvic health connection, you can check out Dr. Bree's new programs, The Academy, The Collective, or The Experience. The Academy is a way to learn all about the new standard of pelvic care in connecting the mind and the body when it comes to pelvic floor health. The Collective is Dr. Bree's membership program for women to gather, connect, and learn together and lift each other up for collective wellness. The experience is Dr. Bree's one-on-one private healing immersion program. Now, if any of these sound fabulous to you, all of the links can be found in my show notes at drjkrausnd.com, episode 451. Let's get on with the podcast. Now, you were mentioning in the darkness retreat, you came up with the the little flame in the pelvic bowl and you were imagining that. Is that kind of like next level from getting present in the moment and working on kind of cultivating this peace and, and cultivating maybe an environment of peace for you too? Tell us yeah, what- well, yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, that was just my visual visualization that helped me. And part of the reason is... Um, I had really realized that when I feel peace in my body, when I personally feel peace in my body, I do feel it in my gut, in my pelvic area. I feel expansive, open, and relaxed there. I mean, I feel it everywhere, but I'm just really connected (laughs) with my pelvic area. It's the work I do. It's 
a very powerful part of the body for anyone, but I happen to be quite connected to it. And I feel like intu intuitive hits and like yeses and nos. I tend to feel it from my gut and my pelvic area. Uh, it's where I feel a lot of things. And so for me, just bringing in that visual of the, of the candle and really cultivating that as a practice when I was in the dark helped make that little candle seem stronger and brighter and more powerful. And then the cool thing is I was able to take that with me after the darkness retreat. And I still, still carry that little candle. If I'm having a hard moment, I will literally bring my imagination to that little candle. And for me, that just, it just changed everything. And some people might want to do something similar in their heart or mm -hmm. in, you know, whatever it may be. It may not be a candle. Maybe it's a teddy bear. I don't know. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, wh whatever works, right? Whatever. whatever works. But something <laughs> to kind of anchor you into and just quickly bring you back. Our minds are, you know, they're meaning making machines and they love visuals. And so anything you can do that really is a quick reset with a visual of some sort is really helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think of it, you know, like you were mentioning, you know, pelvis, like if we talk chakras, right, like we've got some serious energy in the pelvis and, and sacral chakra. And, you know, if we go up to the heart, we've got the heart chakra, throat chakra. You know, I think a lot of folks, when you get quiet and you start to feel things, you know kind of where things might be a little more stuck and you right. might have that awareness and right. and perhaps you know you can expand a little bit on this in terms of how you guide folks in this yeah oh i'm so excited sorry i got so excited i cut you off <laughs> good good let's go do it i love the centers of intuition and the different levels and layers of knowing and i see it as we have different different places in our body where we have this knowing, this like felt sense of like knowing without knowing why. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we can think things through, right? We can like make a pros and cons list, but that's different than like a gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, like an inner knowing, a gnosis. And to me, the different places in my body and my energy body and my chakras, we can totally bring it there. But I, I tend to feel a knowing Definitely in my mind, of course, not even because of thoughts and thinking, but just like a yes. And it just is like, it's almost like it's coming from my mind, like a uh-huh, yep. Mm -hmm. But then also in, for me, I think the throat could definitely, is it's definitely tied into the root. I mean, it's tied into so much, but for me, my layers of knowing are more my mind, my heart, my gut, and my root. So those are the different places where I really feel this this gnosis, this knowing, these hits of like, yes, no, without having done my pros and cons list. And I think that all of those areas can be cultivated by people. And that's such a, you know, big conversation and different for everyone. But I have a theory about folks, and this is absolutely not proven. So I'm really curious to know what you think about this. This is just sure. my sure. own theory. And to me, it really makes sense is that I tend to hold a lot of tension in my pelvic floor. So going back to the, the pelvic floor for me is huge. I have had issues with my pelvic floor. I've had prolapse. I work in my pelvic bowl all day long. I help patients with their pelvic floors. I still feel whenever I have emotions come up in my life, the first place that's impacted is my shoulders tense up and I get massive pelvic tension. I get a knot of tension in my perineum, the area between the vagina and the anus or between the testicles and the anus and uh, male bodies. And that's just the first place I feel stress is my pelvic bowl. And for many other people too. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my theory is that one reason we feel these like hits of intuition that say no or yes, is that when something is right for us, we expand. It's like a it's not a contraction. It's like an expansion. And for me, I think the reason I can literally feel something in my vagina when it's a yes is my muscles are relaxing. I really think that the muscles are just going, oh, or if something is a no, things are tightening up even more. So I do believe that this intuition and places we feel it in our body is not just some you know, necessarily just energy and, and energetics and something kind of ethereal and untangible. I think there's truly some physiological 
muscular tension and release in these different body areas. I have a friend who tends to feel everything in her heart, like yeses or nos are in her heart area. And she has a very, very tight breathing diaphragm. So her breathing diaphragm is just stuck. She doesn't take expansive breaths. She really, you know, it's very been a lifelong of tension through her ribs and her chest. And that, that whole area tends to be really tight physiologically. Her musculoskeletal fascial system is tight there. And so for her, she feels her yes and her no in her heart area, which could also be translated to your diaphragm. Your breathing diaphragm is, you know, right in that area. And so for her, she feels like heart expansion when things are a yes or a no. And I, my theory is because of her lifetime of tension in that part of her body. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, and, and this is something that I think is really great to bring up because I think a lot of people think we work on something and then it never happens again. Like, right. I, oh, we, gosh. we get rid of it. And it's like, no, no, if we think about it Chinese wise, and of course, I'm always going to spin the Chinese medicine side because that's my my foundation and where I think I mean what makes sense to me in life um it's it's just like you're predisposed to having blockages of energy there so you need to cultivate or or practice moving it you mm -hmm. know and so yes like I will see the same thing with a lot of patients who tend to have blood pressure stuff that goes up and down tight chest they feel everything there for me I feel everything right here in the throat mm -hmm. I'll yeah. lay down I'll get super thirsty or I can't talk like all of a sudden it'll be like yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. Well, and to be clear too, I want to make this really clear is even though we're speaking in this regard of the different areas of the body, I also absolutely want to make it very well known that we're not piecemealing the body into different body parts. Like, oh, you know, I only have tension, like it's all connected. Sure. So oftentimes like my, I have tension in my diaphragm too, and my pelvic floor and, you know, things are all connected. Oftentimes throat tension People with throat issues and vocal issues have a lot of pelvic floor issues. So everything is connected. It's just kind of like you were saying, Janine, it's like the different, we all have our different focal point that's kind of an activation point for us that might be a little more active or more, we might notice it more than other parts. But it doesn't mean that your only, my only area that needs attention is my pelvic floor. Like there's, the whole body's connected. So I don't want to feed into the whole piecemeal approach uh, system that many people <laughs> buy into in Western medicine. <laughs> no, and and unfortunately, I mean, you're you're so right because we talk about even in mind body medicine, we talk a lot about different areas, mm -hmm. and so then it makes one think that oh, yeah. it's you know if it's just the throat, then I need to only work on the throat. Well, throat and pelvis are also like you said connected. I mean, yeah. if you it's we're all connected everywhere. Um, but yes, it, it's unfortunate that that's just how Western medicine goes on that is we we end up just thinking automatically to that. And it's like, okay, that's one piece of the puzzle. And today you might have throat, tomorrow you might have. <laughs> yeah. Which is also frustrating for people when it goes from one area to the other. Like, It is it is frustrating, but I think that's the beautiful thing of looking at a whole body, whole person approach is you're no longer chasing pain and chasing symptoms all over the body. You realize it is all connected. And back to what you said just a moment ago, is that it's also a journey. You know, it's not a one and done treatment. It's not going to necessarily be fixed overnight. You know, this is, it's an adventure. It's fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not always fun for people who are in it. I get it. I get it. That probably did not land for somebody listening right now. They're like, no, this is not fun. No. But <laughs> if you take it as a whole person package, and if you know that it's not going to change doesn't happen overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. But if you look at it as kind of an adventure with ups and downs, and this is a journey we're on together, me and my body, then I think it's helpful. Because I mean, what's our other option is we we either take that attitude or we're just miserable. I mean, just miserable. You're miserable. We're cutting off body parts. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and all jo no joking aside, I mean, we're, we're cauterizing nerves. We're taking body parts out, you know, we're fusing things, you know, yeah. worst case scenario, looking into all of the different surgical methods that, you know, small percentage of success. And that's because we have to go back to the energetics of things. And, you know, you had mentioned the journey and, and a lot of people always roll their eyes when I'm like, you know, we have to enjoy the journey, but it's also like, 
how cool is it that we can learn about our bodies and it and our bodies give us feedback and we can manipulate the the you know how it feeds back to things we can bring things down kind of like the neurofeedbacks and biofeedback types of therapies it's so cool it is so cool and i i guess to kind of bring it back to the whole theme of this episode is the one way you can make it feel cool and not overwhelming is to cultivate that little sense of groundedness and peace and presence within because mm-hmm. otherwise it's just going to feel stressful and overwhelming and it's like this journey is like it sucks like it's a bumpy road with rocks and dead ends and i hate it but if you cultivate that sense of inner peace it really becomes more of an adventure. So again, I know a lot of this sounds really cliche and really trite, but it's really powerful. It really is. It is. And I think it's worth giving a chance because I fought it for a long time. Even being an acupuncturist, I was like this energy stuff. I'm like, no, there's got to be something more. (laughs) It's we're, we're amazing creatures. We're amazing creatures. And, and you're harnessing that with, with the new course coming out, but you also have a free mind body challenge too, that I would love for you to talk to folks, because I think, you know, at this point we might be thinking like, okay, Dr. Bree, Janine, these things are kind of maybe a little out there, but like, I'm, I'm intrigued and if I can help, how can I dip my toes in? So yeah. let's talk about the mind body challenge. And then of course, let's move over to talking about the mind body pelvic health Academy too. That's coming out later this spring. Amazing. Yeah. So my mind body challenge, I have a YouTube channel with of loads of videos, almost 750 um, free videos on YouTube. And I can't vouch for the quality of the ones I recorded like 14 years ago, but <laughs> the newer ones are, are great. And I just very recently created a, a 10 day mind, body, pelvic health boot camp. So the idea is it's one video a day for 10 days. And actually there's a bonus. So there's 11 days, but you can absolutely go to my YouTube channel and watch it there. Um, you can just do a search for mind, body, pelvic health boot camp, or there's a playlist and go through them day by day, starting at day one and working your way up till the end. And it just takes you through a lot of the different facets of movement, breath, and sound, learning how our emotions and our mental state impacts our pelvic floor, kind of all the stuff we've talked about today. Um, it breaks it up, but even it brings in like digestion and food, like it's, it's all connected. And so it, it's, it's quite, it's really like a course. I mean, it's quite powerful, the information in here. So you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, there will be ads if you watch it on YouTube, or you can sign up through my new website, which would be briannegrogan.com slash challenge. And that has basically a, a portal that you can enter where it has all of the videos all in one place, no ads. <laughs> so if you prefer no YouTube ads, then that's a great option. And it takes you day by day all the way till day 11 and gives you nice some extra information along the way. So it's a really great way for people to just enter the world of this mind, body, pelvic health concept and how it's all connected. Um, there is a specific spin on pelvic health. So if anyone's you know not interested in pelvic health, you can still use the information, but just know that I will talk about the pelvic floor the entire time. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly... When I get to looking at folks and and, and and in person, when I get my hands on folks in Tacoma, I mean, most people have tension or something going on in the pelvic floor, especially as we get older. And now that I'm seeing people over a decade in the same place, I'm seeing men who have now aged who are starting to have prostate issues. And it's literally, they don't have cancer. It's more just getting the fluid moving in there, yeah. it's stuck. And so I'm seeing that with men, with women, of course, we've got now the the transition from perimenopause and menopause. And a lot of what I start to think about is circulation and, and blood flow and lubrication. You know, do we absolutely need hormones? Maybe not if we get some circulation going a little. Yeah. 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 And I mean, the pelvic area, the pelvic floor is the center of the, of the body. And it's where everything hooks in, you know, the legs hook in the trunk things hook in, it all hooks in there. And then things hook in at your shoulders, of course, your, your shoulder girdle as well. But our pelvic girdle is a very, very 
important piece. And you're right. I think circulation, getting blood flow, getting things moving through these power centers of our shoulder girdle and our pelvic girdle are really important for whole body health. And it's not hard to do at all. It just takes a little, a little education. So that's what I'm here for. Awesome. Awesome. And so the Mind Body Pelvic Health Academy that's coming later this spring, same thing, a little bit more education, but you also have overcome still, still out there. You still have lift as well. So let's, let's talk about the, the more, so we dip our toes in and we're like, yes, give me more Dr. Bree. Let's talk about all of those guys there. Oh, thanks for the opportunity to share this. So I, to clear up this one little aspect of my work yes. <laughs> is I am Brie, I'm Grogan. I'm yeah. my, I'm Brie. Call me Brie. I am Brie. But I have, I'm kind of known online as Vibrant Pelvic Health. So yeah. I have two websites. So Vibrant Pelvic Health is a really great entry point, vibrantpelvichealth.com. That's a really great entry point for anyone who's like, okay, I like this mind body stuff, but just give me some exercises. Like I need to know, give me the nuts and bolts. Like I want to know the foundational stuff. I want some exercises. I need to get into my body and kind of like, you know, really learn how to move my body correctly in a way that's safe for my pelvic floor. So that's a really great entry point for anyone is my vibrant pelvic health website and the programs that are there, which is lift for prolapse relief. That's for pelvic organ prolapse. And it's also good for um, just somebody who wants to strengthen their pelvic area in general. And then I have another program called Overcome Pelvic Pain for Women. And that is for people who have tension and, uh, and pain, painful sex, things like that. That's a really great program for them. So that's a really important entry point for anyone who's wanting to build a foundation. And then if you're kind of like, okay, I like all this mind body stuff you've been talking about. <laughs> that's where you'd want to explore my new website, which is briannegrogan.com. It's a brand new website, brand new pro programs are not even released yet. Of course, the mind body challenge we just talked about, you can sign up for it over on the new website, but my new program, the mind body pelvic health Academy. And then I have a membership called the collective is all on my other website. So I do think that it's important to not overwhelm someone. And if they're like, I just want to know if I'm doing my pelvic floor exercises right, the Vibrant Pelvic Health website and programs might be better for somebody who's okay. there. Okay. Now you mentioned the collective on the new site. So yeah. what's the collective about? Give us a scoop there. Yeah. So the Academy is a is a course, like it's a program and it's for anybody with pelvic health issues or for healthcare providers who work mm. with patients who have pelvic floor issues. Basically we're, everyone needs this information and I'm trying to remove the barrier between patients and health. Like we all need to learn it. So let's just all learn it together. So that's the Academy and it's a program. The collective is also for for any woman, this one is for this, it is for, for women only is the collective. The yeah. Academy is for any human. Okay. The collective is just for women. And it's a monthly membership where we're all going to be gathering together in monthly events where we do a live embodiment movement flow. So we're going to move our emotions and our energy together in community, of course, online, virtual community, but that's convenient. Um, and if people can't catch it live, they can catch the replay. And then there will also be monthly celebration circles where we actually celebrate each other and learn how to not cut each other, you know, learn how to lift each other up and not be in that fear cycle that so many people with pelvic health challenges are in. So it's really meant for people who do have pelvic health challenges of some sort, but it's a way to get them off the Google support forums that are terrifying to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie Downer. It's just so depressing. I'm like, why don't, why don't we talk about wellness? Let's not talk about like all the bad things that, that are going totally. on. Oh. I mean, it's what you focus on expands. And so we're bringing women together who want to uplift one another, who want to focus on, you know, reality and the positive aspects of reality too. Like, so, so anyway, we're going to celebrate once a month. We're going to have the embodiment uh, flows once a month. And then there's other support in between. We have a pelvic health apothecary, which is just a collection of natural remedies for pelvic health. We have uh, weekly uh, inspirational check-ins that I'm going to be doing. There's a community app that, or what's well, really just a, a messaging app that anyone, I, I'm creating a group. So there's a community app. There's all sorts of ways to connect with like-minded people who are on the path that you want to be on too. And so I'm bringing that together with the collective. 
Love it. Love it. Because yeah, you know, you get on these forums and you're like, I just <laughs> like, you know, the menopause ones that I tend to troll, I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, like I'm so depressed. Oh. You know, walking out of here, thyroid ones, even worse. You I know? can't even look. I can't do it. I'm like, mm -mm, nope. <laughs> it just sucks the energy out of you. And so for those of you guys that are looking at those, yes, it's a great place to maybe find a little information, but look at your energy when you come yeah. out of it and just yeah. be like, whoa, did I just get wiped out? So right. this is a place and I love that you're doing that. And I mean, that's why I want to bring women together that are all about cultivating wellness and talking about wellness versus, you know, problem, 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 problem. Yeah. And, yeah. and blah. Blah. We're getting, we're getting rid of it. It's out. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. it, exactly. Changing the culture of healthcare here at this point. So definitely folks, you guys, I will put both websites over on my podcast notes at drjcrossnd.com. I will make sure it's out on Instagram as well. And we'll just put it all out as much as we possibly can. And so as, as per the future, I know we'll be talking again. I'm excited for spring of 2024 because I really want to see that academy because I too want to learn more because it's it's just important for everybody to get a little sense of what's going on with the pelvic health. So Dr. Bree, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me and everything you're doing to help elevate the energetic vibe of folks out there. Thank you. Yeah. On my new website is I've been saying, you know, we're setting a new standard for pelvic care mm -hmm. and that's this standard is the standard that looks at the whole person and not just doing a couple kegels and calling it a day because there's so much more. So much guys. And hopefully you've heard it here. Hopefully it's setting in a little bit and we'll just keep working on you just one little step at a time. Thanks again, Dr. Bree. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.